said, uh, former Federal President of the Young Liberals and now currently the Director of Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs. Let's make him welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and thanks for organising this debate and to all of you for coming out today. I think it's very exciting. Um, capitalism is better than socialism. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, obviously I presumed that after more than 200 years of poverty alleviation <laughs> that the human flourishing unleashed by the creativity machine that is the capitalist economic system would be accepted as self-evidently a good thing and that the grey failure of the soul destruction that is socialism would be obvious. Uh, but of course we're on a university campus and we're not out in the real world. So let's go back to basics. And let me tell you a story that most of your university professors will never tell you. Put simply, capitalism is a system of economic organisation based on private ownership of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Capitalism is free market economics. And by free market economics, I don't mean crony capitalism. Uh, I don't mean bailouts for the banks. I don't mean an economic system that includes agencies of the state like the IMF and the World Bank. It's not even the status quo. Uh, and I want to make that clear from the start because I don't expect that our opponents will play this game fairly. I don't think that they'll engage constructively in this debate. What I expect is a list of terrible things currently happening in the world and for them to say that it's all capitalism's fault. What I expect to see is the, the blame game in full flight. But it's important to understand that many of these problems, and there are problems, are caused by socialism and caused by an overbearing state. And they can and will be solved by the unceasing force for good that is capitalism. More, more, more on, oh, it's good to be back at university. More on that, more on that soon. Free market capitalism, as I've said, is an economic system that is free from the restraints of a coercive state. It's a system in which individuals operate freely in pursuit of their own self-interest. The free market is an aggregation of thousands of mutually beneficial voluntary exchanges between consenting adults free from any form of aggression. Socialism is pretty much the opposite of that. It's an economic system which advocates state control over the means of production, distribution and exchange. I think socialism <laughs> fails because it suppresses the most basic of human instincts. Self-interest. <laughs> Capital capitalism takes human beings as they are and harnesses self-interest into a system that produces good outcomes for everyone. Let me explain just a few examples. The National Review recently surveyed global poverty and found capitalism has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The proportion of people in developing countries living on less than $1.25 per day has been cut in half. In China, 680 million people have been lifted out of poverty alone, and extreme poverty has gone from 84% in 1980, before the liberalising reforms in China, to less than 10% in 2013. In Africa, per capita real incomes rose by 97% between just 1990 and 2010. Hunger in India shrank by 90% after the country replaced 40 years worth of socialist government with capitalist reforms in just 1991. Stephen Moore at the free market think tank Cato in the United States put together a table of the 25 best trends of the 20th century. Some of those include life expectancy in years over the 20th century has gone from 47 to 77. Infant mortality has gone from 100 to just 7. Deaths from infectious disease per 100,000 has gone from 700 to 50. Heart disease has gone from 307 to 126 across 100,000. Manufacturing wages have gone from just $3.40 to $12.50. Poverty rate has been reduced from 40% to 13%. Agricultural workers, as a proportion of the economy, have gone from 35% of the economy to just 2.5% of the economy. Television ownership. No one owned a TV at the beginning of the 20th century. Now 98%. 98. That's just, that's just since the 1960s. Just 98% of US households now own them. 
Home ownership has gone from 46 per cent to 66 per cent. Yeah. Electrification has gone from 8 per cent to 99 per cent. People can warm themselves and read by lights at night. Telephone calls. 40 were made back at the beginning of the 20th century and 2,300 are able to be made now. Accidental deaths. Accidental deaths per 100,000 has dropped from 88 to 34. Black incomes have gone on a per capita basis in 1997 dollars from just $1,200 to $12,400. Air pollution since just 1997 has been reduced from micrograms of lead in the air from 135 to 4. <laughs> colleagues, <laughs> colleagues, colleagues of mine, Michaela Novak and Dom Talamanides, found in 2014 very similar results here in Australia. Since the 1950s, average tonnage amount of wheat harvested per hectare has consistently broken the one tonne per hectare mark. Yields are now more consistently reaching two tonnage per hectare in spite of the drought and other adverse weather conditions. Uh, they did this, this uh, incredible study which looked at the cost of appliances in people's homes. In the 1990s, uh, just 33% of people owned an air conditioner. In the 2010s, that was up to 73%. Dishwashers went from 25% to 52%. Fridges went from the 1960s, 94% to 100% in the 1990s, 100% to the 2000s, 100% in the 2010s. <laughs> to understand, and, and that the lowest, this is the most important thing, that the lowest quintile of income earners, their average real earnings increased $7,600 just since the year 2000. Let's turn now to socialism. To understand the epic failure of socialism, one need look only no further than Venezuela, where a friend of mine, where a friend of mine, Carlos, lives with his family. Well, you might laugh, uh, and it's easy to laugh about it here in Melbourne, but if you're living a life under the heavy hand of the government in Venezuela, it's no laughing matter. Government spending has fuelled rampant inflation, where the average over the last few years has been 22 per cent during Hugo Chavez's tenure. Uh, his anti-capitalist rhetoric and broad state intervention into the economy have led to a death of investment. Gross fixed capital formation declined 18 per cent of the gross product in 2011 from 24 per cent in 1999, according to the World Bank. Net inflows of foreign direct investment stood at just 2.9 per cent of GDP. Capital flight from Venezuela intensified as Mr Chavez pursued more interventionist policies, including capital controls and fixed official exchange rate. <coughs> Rather than pursue policies that might stimulate investment, the government's response to shrinking productive capacity and high inflation has been price caps. The result has been shortages of food and other basic necessities to the point where Venezuela ran out of toilet paper. Uh, to the point where condoms cost as much in Venezuela as an iPhone in the United States. Venezuela's oil production has fallen to around 2.5 million barrels a day from about 3.2 million, according to most industry estimates. Energy-rich Venezuela has been importing more fuels. Still, prices for the country's crude have risen about tenfold, so Mr Chavez has been quite lucky. That's helped the economy grow, albeit at a lacklustre annual rate of 3% since 1999. GDP capita rose to an estimated $11,000 last year. And, and, and this isn't just an economic problem. The national homicide rate of 73 per 100,000 is more than double 31 per 100,000 in Colombia, which is fighting two guerrilla insurgencies. As Charles Murray explained recently in the Wall Street Journal, from the dawn of history until the 18th century, every society in the world was impoverished, with only the thinnest film of wealth on top. Then came capitalism and industrial revolution. Everywhere that capitalism subsequently took hold, national wealth began to increase and poverty began to fall. Everywhere that capitalism didn't take hold, people remained impoverished. Everywhere that capitalism has been rejected since then, poverty has increased. So why does capitalism yield such positive outcomes? No doubt our opponents might make something of the existence of inequality. But we shouldn't be afraid of inequality. 
<laughs> Differences in the value of labour, for instance, encourage us to enter more productive areas of the economy, which leads to the provision of more goods and services and better quality goods and services at a lower cost to everyone else around us. These differences are necessary to a well-functioning economy. What's important is whether over time the poor get richer or whether they get poorer, whether they're able to meet their needs and the needs of their family or not. And as I've shown, the story of the past 200 years, the story of capitalism, is the story of how capitalism has saved and continues to save the poor. <laughs> and why does socialism fail? Ludwig von Mises, arguably the greatest economist of all time, identified the key problem faced by those advocating for a centrally planned economy, incomplete information. Without correct and complete information, central planners are incapable of making rational and economic decisions. He called this the economic calculation problem. At the heart of his thesis is the idea that prices determined by supply and demand contain information relevant to the decision about savings, production and consumption. Without the otherwise unquantifiable complexity of information contained in a price, socialism is doomed to hopeless, hopeless failure. negative is going to be Hasha uh, Kadkol. Hasha is a science student here at Melbourne Uni. She's the president of the Students for Palestine Club uh, on campus and she's an active member of the Socialist Alternative Club. So please make her welcome. Alright guys, if you could make it through that endless boring list of stats about Venezuela, then um, you can sort of listen to the stats that I have that are uh, about capitalism and the way that it actually functions. So I think the, the myth that capitalism presents equal opportunities is something that we have to put to bed straight away. It is actually a system in which the vast majority of people are systematically excluded from the plenty which humanity has created over the past 200, 304, since um, humanity started organising in society. So the Oxfam Davos report, um, which is widely regarded as like the definitive um, report on inequality in the world, um, from January this year, showed that only 62 people, they own um, more wealth than the poorest half of the world's population. So that's 3.5 billion people, more or less, um, half of the world's population. And this, is, this rampant inequality has actually increased since just last year. So last year, it was 85 people that owned that same, um, that were the balance to those 3.5 billion people. And the same report gives various shades to the same fact um, that inequality is actually ever increasing despite what the um, previous speaker said. Um, so looking at this from the other end of the scale, so since 2010, there's a lot of feedback, it's really weird. Um, since 2010, um, the wealth of the poorest half that I talked about <laughs> <laughs> has actually decreased by over one trillion dollars. That's 38% decrease just since tw um, 2010. Um, even though the population of the world has actually increased in that time by 400 million, this is absurd. Um, and we actually now know about the trillions of dollars um, that are stored in offshore tax havens um, that were revealed in the Panama Papers, which actually would skew um, this report even further um, out of proportion um, with, his, with, with um, what is actually considered just um, in society. So capitalism is actually the most unequal type of society that's ever existed. All the talk about alleviating um, poverty and all of that is absolute garbage. Um, the wealth divide in just America alone today is greater than ancient Roman society. So get this, a society in which people actually owned other people in order to get the work of society done, that was less unequal than America today. And I think that's shocking. And I think people accept that America is pretty unequal, um, especially since the global financial crisis. It's well publicised that um, things are getting worse and worse over there. But in Australia, the situation is not substantially better. In fact, the statistics on inequality in Australia are very shocking. Um, the report on the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, for 2013 to 14 shows that the top 20% of households own 62% of the wealth in Australia. 
um, whereas the bottom 20% only owns 1%. So this is in Australia, the supposed lucky country, the land of equality and all of this um, garbage. And if we look on top of the wealth inequality, uh, the racial and gender inequality, homophobia, um, these things manifest themselves often violently in the form of institutionalised oppression. So you look at the pr police brutality in the US, um, where one black person is shot in the streets by the police every 26 hours, to the fact that even though Aboriginal people are only 3% of the population here, they disproportionately die in police custody. And so all of this garbage about capitalism being free from the coercive state um, is absolutely ridiculous um, when it's the police, an arm of the state, um, that's killing people um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, and it's really hard to believe that this level of inequality is merely an accident, as um, this guy was saying. Um, so this, these ph phenomena are actually structural. Um, there's no way that this kind of scale of inequality could be just an accident. And nor is it to do with the failings of individuals, which might be something that people, um, right-wing hacks might argue as well. Um, the statistics on the complete lack of social mobility under capitalism are shocking. Like, it was easier, to go back to ancient Roman society, it was easier for slaves to become slave owners um, in ancient Rome than anyone from a working class background today to become a millionaire. And, you know, additionally, this grand scheme of equal opportunities cannot account for why wars happen, um, often expense at the expense of the very same people who are excluded from this wealth. So people in Africa, people in the Middle East, um, excluded from wealth and power. And the reality of capitalism is not that every individual is alike and relates to each other in the same way um, as equal individuals. It's a class divided society. A large majority of people do all of the work in society to make it run, um, creating all of the wealth that we see in the system, and these people are the working class. Um, the capitalists sustain themselves from this labour, but they do none of it themselves. Gina Reinhart has never worked a day in her life, um, yet owns uh, like $8 billion of wealth or whatever the latest statistic is. They exploit the working class to get that wealth. And up until this point, it's actually quite similar to other types of society like feudalism that are now history, but what makes capitalism different is that everything that the working class produces is not made in the interests of meeting anybody's immediate needs, not even that of the capitalists, but is made to be sold on the market for a profit. Mm -hmm. Profit or its future realisation drives every process under capitalism. Decisions only get made with this in mind. Decisions about what's produced, how it is produced, for whom everything produced is a commodity. So you have a situation where there is, according to Oxfam again, there is enough food to feed the world's population for a year, one and a half times over, but most of it gets dumped in the ocean or burned like um, John Steinbeck's oranges in the Grapes of Wrath, Well, one person every three seconds starves to death in the world. Like I think that's absolutely absurd, not rational as um, the free marketeers would um, maintain. Or the, if you want to talk about air pollution, fossil fuel use is destroying the planet and increasingly people's lives, um, even though the technology exists to halt it and has existed for um, quite a number of years now. And so I think we need to look at why this exploitation happens. Um, it's because the infrastructure and resources that allow things to, to be produced, so sections of the economy, are owned by capitalists um, as private property. Um, but capitalists, as we said before, because they don't do any work, they didn't create any of these things. They're the products of the past labour of workers. So, in fact, the things that workers create are not under their ownership or even under any extent of control. Um, not even the process by which they're made is under the control of the people who actually do this process. So the capitalists dictate all of the terms and conditions in the workplace and the mysterious hand of the market is responsible for the distribution of the products um, of the labour of workers. Therefore, the capitalists have immense economic and social power. And that's another thing that um, ordinary people as individuals under capitalism do not have equal opportunity to access. So in a fundamental sense then, capitalism is highly unfree, um, despite what the freedom society might maintain. Workers, they don't own any of the means of making wealth, so therefore, they must work for a wage in order to survive. So technically though they're free to work for whomever they choose, um, economic necessity forces them into a bond of exploitation. The choice is to take whatever shitty job you're offered or die. That's the choice that exists under capital capitalism. It's a false choice. The vast bulk of the working class or um, oppressed sections of society cannot just break from this um, and become a capitalist to reap the benefits of this system based on profit. 
even though they do all of the work in the workplace, produce everything, they have as individuals no control over any part of the process of productions, nor were the products of their labour go. I think it's really weird how you keep clapping when I say things like free or individual, it's really odd. Um, capitalism is a system in which the 99% of people are able to pursue lives unrestrained by the dictates of the market, a market that often plunges millions and millions of people into unemployment and deprivation. There isn't even free movement of people around the globe, like refugees come across borders, um, barbed wire um, and guns often when they try to do so. Only commodities have the ability to go wherever they want as long as they're making someone a profit at the end of their journey. If you want to talk about the creative machine, um, the creative potential of humanity is absolutely enslaved to the market. Innovation only happens yeah. as long as it allows a capitalist to compete, compete better with their rivals. Um, and most people don't get to exercise any creativity um, and freedom of expression at all, not even in the parts of their lives deemed most intimate like their sexuality. So clearly from an understanding of how capital, capitalism works and its true nature, the case for an alternative is quite obvious to normal people. So let's define what that alternative is. Firstly, socialism has never before existed in human history. We live in a global capitalist system. Stalinist Russia was not socialist or communist or anything like that. Um, nor is North Korea, not even Venezuela. Um, nice. So why is that? Because socialism is not just about a planned economy as opposed to the free market, um, and nor is it about state-owned property as opposed to privately-owned property. It's about the relationships between people that come from their relation to the economy. And in those countries, it's the case that the setup is almost exactly the same as capital capitalism everywhere else. A majority works to produce everything in society and a tiny layer of people expropriate what's created. A socialist society is one in which the vast abundance of which humanity has created is put to use, meeting the needs of all people, instead of being short in offshore tax havens like um, shown by the Panama Papers, in which people aren't just bare minimum surviving or not surviving at all, which is the case under capitalism, but people are enjoying human achieve achievements. True freedom from economic slavery, of exploitation from racial, gender and sexual inequality will be achieved. Freedom from bombs that rain down on parts of the world for years without end. So how does this work? We get rid of the system in which only a tiny parasitic layer of people control production and therefore have the power to run society in their interests. And we have a system in which everyone contributes as they can and gets back what they need. The people who do the work have collective dem democratic control over production, which is the opposite of what exists in the workplace under capitalism. The opposition says that they're for freedom. If they actually were, they would have workers in control of what they do in their day-to-day -day lives. I think it's pretty obvious what people would choose and what millions around the globe actually increasingly are choosing. It's a choice between equal and a just society and the reality of the capitalist world we live in today. And I think the choice is pretty obvious. <laughs> Our next speaker is John Hajek, who is the campus coordinator of the Generation for Liberty and also president of the Freedom Society. Let's make him up. Has anyone heard that joke that goes, um, I feel like a mosquito at a nudist colony? No. Because I simply don't know where to start. I mean, it would take me about <laughs> six hours to debunk all the economic illiteracy that Harsha, to her credit, managed to cram into a speech of only about 10 minutes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've only got about 10 minutes with which to debunk all that garbage. So I suppose I'll have to start somewhere by saying that the socialist alternative lost this debate really hard. Yeah. That was for many reasons. The first reason why they absolutely fell on their ass in this debate was that they totally dodged this debate. Notice how the topic was not that capitalism is good or that socialism is bad. It was that capitalism is better than socialism. Notice what Simon did was to say why capitalism is good and why socialism is bad and compare them directly. What this debate requires you to do as the negative team is not just to say that capitalism is responsible for lots of problems. You can prove that capitalism is the worst, like a terrible, terrible system and still lose this debate. Although you did a pretty flimsy job of that too, I might add. <laughs> what it also requires you to do is do more than mention this so-called socialist alternative that you're proposing. You spent about one minute at the end of your speech and it was all 
it was all platitudes. We, knew, we need more than a, like a society based on fairness where people can own the product of their labour and communal decisions are made and community controls the means of production. You need to give us mechanisms. How can the dismal planning boards that you set up once you've massacred the bourgeoisie and done away with all the <laughs> obsolete relics of an exploded feudal system, how can they do economic planning effectively and produce the goods they need? That was totally absent from the first bigger speech. That is terminal, and that's why you lost this debate. The second reason was that they gave a nonsense definition of what capitalism and socialism is. We gave a very clear one at Simon. The response they gave was that, no, capitalism is a system of class divides and entrenched poverty with a few rich people at the top. You can argue if you want that that's a result of capitalism, but you'd be wrong. You may not argue that that is the definition itself of capitalism. It would be like us saying we define socialism as a system of human enslavement, grinding poverty and misery, gross resource allocation, decay and death. That is what it is, but we're not entitled to argue that that's the definition. Also, Simon gave a perfectly clear definition of what capitalism is. Private ownership of the means of production and private ownership of property, free trade, low regulation of labour markets and business markets, minimal redistribution of wealth. What part of that said, also, you've got to support the war in Iraq? What part of that said you can't have to oppose refugees coming to Australia or that you've got to be homophobic or oppose same-sex marriage? All the time you spent on that was totally wasted. Now, Getting to the core of this debate, Simon brought up in his speech the problem of economic calculation. And it goes to a very boring but very salient point that the greatest economist of all time, Ludwig von Mises, made about capitalism and socialism in this debate. In the absence of market prices that have to emerge in a free market as a result of millions of diffuse buyers and sellers making transactions and following their own private interests, market prices that that tell you the alternative uses of particular resources cannot exist. You cannot perform economic calculation without prices and without the profits to tell you that you are allocating resources effectively and producing goods that are worth more than the sum of their parts. The fact that we literally got zero seconds of response to this point is very telling. And I think it's an embarrassment that a team that calls themselves a socialist alternative can stand up here, argue for a violent revolution, and not even tell us how we're going to decide what combinations of resources, of glass yeah. and steel, of leather and wood, we're going to use to make consumer goods. How are your dismal Politburo is going to make this decision for us? You are doomed to be groping in the dark forever in this debate when under a socialist utopia because you do not have the signals that only capitalism can provide. So let's talk about inequality. Inequality, we think, uh, is not, well, firstly, we think inequality is extremely important. Let's pause for a second and not just be sanctimonious university students who want to crusade against inequality. How the hell do you do without inequality? Inequality is the one thing that means people can put in effort to work hard and take risks in order to benefit themselves and increase their income. I'm sorry guys, that's true. And it's not just about putting more work in it, putting more hours into the plan. It's about doing things like sinking billions or millions of your own dollars, hard-earned dollars, into that in order to produce goods that serve. So you need to tell us what is your way of enc encouraging people to work hard if inequality is not allowed. Tell us. So. Also, we think it's no problem with inequality per se, as long as it's not cronious and it's not the result of government privileges and the coercive power of the state. Or as long as it's not the fault of terrible socialist initiatives like bad public schools, like the minimum wage, which makes it illegal to employ people with low schools, like the war on drugs. We think, we think you need to like, consider those things before you hang your hat on inequality for us. But also, if, like, in the name of, we think, if it's a totally free market and you achieve inequality and become far wealthier than someone else, quite frankly, I can't believe you think it's any of your business how wealthy people are. So, <laughs> Harsha told us, she said that we need to realise that capitalism is not a system of equality of opportunity. We totally agree. We never said that it was. What we said it was, is a system of quality of opportunity where it's allowed hundreds of millions of people in India and China to now access like the standard of living that there was no way they could access before when they were living under the, so the yoke of socialism. <clears throat> then Harsha brought out this bogus statistic about 64 people of the world's richest people are wealthier than the bottom 30%. 
The reason why that's nonsense is this, or whatever it was, the reason why this is nonsense is because that measure is based on net worth, and your net worth can be negative if you're, say, a wealthy university student who's just graduated a law degree with a debt of $50,000 or $100,000. By this measure, you are poorer than a rural Chinese farmer who has no debt but might have a few assets. And that's obviously a stupid measure. That's why the people at the very bottom of this list in net worth are actually people like the Clintons when they got out of the White House. We're not very worried about those people in this debate. And it's also true that you, like I, have more money than the poorest 30% of people in the world or whatever it was, just because I don't have any debt. And that's why it's also just ridiculous and misleading for Harsha to say that some, like, by the same token that the wealth of the poorest whatever it was percentage of this society has decreased by X trillion dollars over the past however many years. Yes, that's a good sign because it means more people are being enfranchised into free markets and they get more access to credit, to go to university, to invest in a business, to improve their lives and expand their productivity. That means they get put in the bottom 30% or that means they have a negative net worth. It's actually a sign of economic progress so that material was irrelevant and you wasted your time on it in this debate. Also, we will not take blame for unjust inequality in this debate. We say, get the government's socialist boot off the p throat of poor people before you blame us for anything. Things like minimum wages, things like a Soviet-style public education system, things like occupational, li <laughs> occupational licensure, which is the essence of social planning, essence of economic planning, whereby bureaucrats determine who is to do what job and who isn't. So, on exploitation, we think it's empirically impossible because why would exploitation be so rife when wages have gone up so consistently around the world? Especially in countries like China, where they've gone up about 10 percentage points a year over the last few decades, where trade unions are also banned. And in that case, yeah. why would people, would workers, line up to be exploited so much? Harsha tried to tell us, well, it's about economic coercion. I've got bad news for you guys. Grinding poverty is the default state of humanity and like the universe does not entitle you to anything else. To the extent that some businessman can offer you a job, it's even got deplorable conditions or deplorable pay by our wealthy standards in the West, then we think that's a good thing and you have every right to take it. If firms use coercion, by the way, and generally exploit people, then that is antithetical to the free market. Isn't that eight minutes now? Also, okay, so on profits, Harsha showed her real economic illiteracy on this point. Let me explain what a profit is. Profit is the premium that capitalists get from forwarding, forwarding workers the end product of their production so they can survive while they go through the difficult process of accumulating capital and producing things for final sale. I hope you got that because you've got no excuse now for coming up with this drivel about how profits are derived from exploitation. Because although it is true that Gina Reinhardt and Daniel Grollo don't physically lift the stones or mine the iron ore, they literally save their workers from starving to death by forwarding them their wages. And I think that should be rewarded. On climate change, on climate change, CO2 is actually not just a byproduct of capitalism. What it is is a byproduct of production using fossil fuels. So thank you for conceding that socialist utopias pr produce far fewer goods and services for people of enjoyment. That might be why socialist basket cases do have lower carbon footprints than capitalist countries. But also, that's not even true because the so in the Soviet Union, it took four times as many resources, natural resources, to produce the same car as it did in Japan at the time. That is bad for the environment and bad for people's standard of living. Lastly, we think capitalism is more morally superior because it's the only system that doesn't rely on state-backed violence and the only system that allows people to make their own mutual accommodations and exchanges with each other free from your invigilation and your supervision. When you hear someone say, I hate the free market, they probably think they're being really clever and iconoclastic. What they're really saying is, I hate people's ability to make their own mutual accommodations without each other, without my invigilation, without my, without my coercive intercession. That is a sociopathic view. It's why you lost this debate and that's why we're so proud to propose. Thanks. Uh, our next speaker is Con Caravius, who is a um, former social justice and environment uh, officer at the Monash Student Union, now an art student here at Melbourne Uni, and he's going to be the final speaker. Um, all right, well, I just want to start by brushing aside a couple of the red herrings that are. Uh, good old Donald Trump and Donald Trump Jr. up here have thrown forth in the start of this debate. The first one is this ridiculous, invidious thing that free market capitalism embodies freedom in our society. The creativity machine, it was called. Individuals operating... Uh, I've mixed some of your quotes, but unfortunately they all jumble together that way anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But the few spies and sellers, so on and so forth. The reason we go on about class actually ties very, very directly to this issue of freedom, because... 
in one regard, it's a fair enough point to make that you look everywhere around the world, you only have to look at the Panama Papers to see that an extraordinary amount of freedom does exist in our society, that if you own a corporation, if you are a politician who perhaps owns a great deal of capital yourself, it doesn't matter if you live in China or Japan, it doesn't matter if you live in Britain or France or Iceland, whose Prime Minister was re uh, recently fabulously deposed, it doesn't matter if you live in China or Russia or Syria or Iraq or Australia or Peru or Chile, you have an extraordinary amount of freedom, freedom to the tune of trillions and trillions of dollars with one offshore legal firm, what is it, 2.3 terabytes of data, 1.3 million separate documents, 200,000 companies around the world, including 800 companies and politicians in Australia who can keep trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars worth of capital in one of these offshore tax havens, face no repercussions whatsoever and move that capital around where they will. It doesn't matter what country you live in, it doesn't matter the nature of the state there, whether it self-identifies as socialist, communist, capitalist or what you will. That is the freedom that you have if you're a part of the ruling class. On the other hand, the freedoms that are entitled to ordinary working class people who own none of this capital, not only do they not obviously have that freedom, hilariously the previous speaker said, oh, you can do whatever you like with your billions and billions of dollars, <laughs> not really a freedom for the vast majority of people on this planet, but even the most basic human rights, basic liberties that ordinary people should be entitled to are thoroughly denied by the system. You only have to look at the massive refugee crisis of 60 million people around the world. And yes, people who were displaced from their homes, by and large, due to capitalism. It was due to capitalist colonisation of the Middle East, imperialist wars, duking out areas of influence, fighting for oil, fighting for trade routes. This is what has displaced millions of people from Iraq, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from throughout the greater Middle East. And it is due to the alliances between our capitalist governments and dictatorial regimes such as that in Saudi Arabia or that in uh, Sri Lanka, which causes millions of people to seek asylum from those places as well. So you can see in our society that there is an enormous amount of unity at the top and that the people at the top get their way however they will, whereas for the rest of us, we are deprived of practically everything. But not only that, that unity at the top is derived from the fact that they share, are united by the logic of capitalism, that it is the people at the top in our society universally who own all of the means of production, which as our speakers here said, is the distinguishing characteristic of a capitalist society. It is, those people, it is those people who run those means of production exclusively so as to generate a profit for themselves, and it's those people who compete with one another in order to maximise their own profits and keep themselves afloat on the market quite ruthlessly most of the time against their rivals. And this brings us to the second red herring, because the speakers have gone on and on and on at length about how state institutions, institutional repression, economic regulation, what you will, this has nothing to do with the ideals of a free market capitalist society. Well, this is all just garbage. You might disagree with the statistics about inequality, though, I assume that's because you wish they were greater statistics of inequality, <laughs> seeing as it seems to be your favourite thing on the planet. But the simple fact is that a system of such exorbitant amounts of inequality, not just on a global scale, not just in the third world or the undeveloped world, in Australia, the nine richest people have as much wealth as the poorest four and a half million people. Two and a half million people live below the poverty line, etc., etc. Such a system can only be maintained through extreme amounts of state repression that's tied to that economic coercion, and that's what those institutions exist so as to uphold. So the great champion of free market capitalism, the American ruling class, also imprisons more people than any other society in human history. Over two million people locked behind jails uh, as of this precise moment in the United States. But part of even why you can see that it's all ridiculous, all this crap about free market capitalism has nothing to do with state intervention, nothing to do with an economically uh, relevant government or what you will, is that the people who advocate for those sort of ideas give the game away themselves. That for decades and decades and decades, this has been the dominant economic orthodoxy in Western societies. Deregulate everything, slash social services, open everything up to the free market and society 
will advance. Well, in 2007 and 2008, we saw what a load of bullshit that was, didn't we? Because when the economic crisis happened, when the banks went bust in the United States, and the consequences of that flowed through throughout the entirety of Europe and throughout most of the rest of the world, those same people, the people who for decades and decades and decades had told the state to get out of the economy, to stop investing in education, stop investing in social services, they turned around to every government in the United States, in Europe, and said, give us trillions of dollars to save save our enterprises and to save our banks. And those states did that because at the end of the day, those states are intimately connected with the capitalist economy. And we've seen the consequences of that ever since have not just been more money flowing upwards into the pockets of the big banks and so forth, but that money actively extracted from the poor and the working class. Massive measures of austerity enacted on people throughout the entirety of Europe, throughout the entirety of Latin America, North America, even the Middle East, you could say North Africa, pretty much every single corner of the planet. Which brings me to another point, which is the point that the affirmative speakers have made about progress, that capitalism has generated enormous amounts of progress for humanity, brought people out of poverty en masse, etc., etc. Now, in one sense, there is something to the dynamics of capitalism, which obviously have led to economic and industrial advances over the previous societies, such as feudalism, slave-owning societies, where people mostly scrounged around in the dirt to um, give themselves a living. But if that's your argument, fair enough. You'll probably find the most articulate expression of it in the Communist Manifesto, funnily enough. So <laughs> I recommend you read that one if you want to improve your own economic literacy. But <laughs> the simple fact is that today we are very much living in a period of counter-reform, that all the arguments around capitalism just organically leading to development that benefits the rest of humanity are self-evidently obvious. That currently we have a government in Australia, some lions capitalist country, which just last week the Prime Minister said, I want to federally defund all, pu all public secondary schools while continuing to give money to the private schools. They want to strip away Medicare um, and public health care systems. They want to deregulate university fees, again, strip public funding from the universities, and the list goes on and on and on. You only have to look at the extent to which, say, Indigenous people's living standards are being driven back who live in the Northern Territory and Western Australia, not arbitrarily, but because of capitalism, because the Australian economy rests on the mining industries, rests on such and lion souls as Gina Reinhart, Clive Palmer, Twiggy Forrester, and so forth. And so when they want access to minerals that are based in the Northern Territory, it's not only that the government gives that to them, they send in the military, they send in the the police force, they put Indigenous people in jails so as to make way for those mining magnets. That's what free market competition looks like. Nonetheless, it is true that progress has been won under capitalism. It's true that um, wages have gone up in China in the last little while, in India as well. It's true that there have certainly been advances won in terms in the in the sphere of labour for working class people. But that is the point of having socialist politics. Those things were never conceded by the enlightened souls like Gina Reinhardt, whose father once said it would be for the best if Indigenous people were chemically castrated so as to move them off their land permanently. It has happened through the organic and grassroots struggles of working class people, overwhelmingly, who've had socialist politics. So the key thing about China in the past few years, if you're such a savant when it comes to recent Chinese history, is that the working class has waged an extraordinary series of waves of incredible strikes, sometimes involving hundreds and hundreds of thousands of workers all at once, which has put their foot on the throat of the system and forced the bosses to concede demands to them. It's true of the history of progressive reforms in Australia, where things like like Medicare, for instance, was saved through a general strike in the country. The great reforms, the great advances in conditions for ordinary people have only been won through that form of mass struggle because that ruthless nature of the competition means that actually exploitation is not just the backbone of the system, but ever greater exploitation is the backbone of the system. The bosses, the capitalists are perennially looking to extract more and more wealth from the people they employ so as to be able to compete with their rivals on the market. So if you want an alternative to all of that, part of it is starting with that standpoint of the mass democratic collective struggles of working class people which actually have already under this barbaric system driven their living conditions forward and offer potential to save what we've won in the past today but an alternative system has to be built on not just that collective struggle winning concessions from the people at the top not looking to some bureaucracy or some state we think that's bullshit we're the real anti-status in this room it's looking to those mass democratic struggles whereby people can take control of their own workplaces they already ready to do all the work anyway. We don't need Gina Reinhardt 
Donald Trump, James Packer, Daniel Grollo, who you will. These people are just parasites. If we could instead organise collectively the workplaces by the people who do the work and produce for human need across the entire economy, and unfortunately, I don't have time, but there's a very rich history that people should look into there, that actually provides a means by which to go forward, which is my closing remark, that the debate between capitalism and socialism is not just some highfalutin intellectual discussion about which set of ideas could potentially better organise the world as it is. It's a debate that's about are we going to continue to stagnate as a society facing catastrophic global warming, mass starvation still, imperialist war all across the planet, the destruction of that planet itself, incre increasing poverty as Harsh has said, or are we going to fight for a world in which the enormous productive resources that have been created by humanity are harnessed towards the end of benefiting the life for everyone and providing a basis in which people do not have to live in inscrutable poverty but have actual liberation and the capacity to live their own lives as they choose and that's why the ideas around socialism matter so much for everyone in the world today.